the Trump presidency is really at the heart of the crisis uh, of multilateralism. Give us a sense of how much damage you think uh, the presidency um, has, uh, has done so far. Uh, in the first few months, a lot of people focused on the words, the rhetoric, uh, and tried to ignore the policies or to think that you know, the words and the policies don't, or that there isn't much correlation. Um, it seems that after all, there is a correlation between the rhetoric and the policies. As coming from Washington, I must say, I'm grateful for the opportunity to get out of town. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, things are a little <laughs> bit crazy <laughs> these days. So not being in the same time zone uh, has a certain psychological benefit for, for us journalists. Um, you know, I, having spent a lot of my career uh, focused on international affairs, it really it is an uh, unusual situation to have, to say the least, for Washington to be really essentially the epicenter of global instability. Uh, this is not something uh, that I ever thought was possible in my lifetime, and politically, we're really in uncharted territory every day in many ways. And, you know, your question... I think gets to the heart of it, which is how are we to understand and to rationalize uh, in some ways the, the irrational. And you did hear, uh, especially at the beginning of the Trump administration, many people making the argument it was meant to be reassuring. I, in fact, this, this group of people, I called them the reassurers uh, because what they would say to visiting alarmed Europeans and others was, okay, you know, don't pay attention to the tweets, don't worry, essentially the grown-ups will be in charge and, and they'll, they'll take care of it, they'll channel these impulses, the public spectacle may be distasteful to you, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a control of it. And I think there's a new realism about what's going on and it's actually clear that you should pay attention to the tweets, first of all, uh, and uh, that might cause a lot of additional stress in your life, uh, depending on, uh, you know, what connection you have to, to the policy that comes out of Washington. But you do have to pay attention to the unfiltered uh, uh, ramblings and pronouncements of a president of the United States. It's, it's a unique window uh, into what's happening in the White House that we've never had before. And it may change politics, not just for the next few years, but uh, inalterably. And then as far as the policy consequences, I think, Rula, that you're absolutely correct that President Trump has, in my view, been strikingly consistent in uh, the themes that he strikes and his effort to turn those into policies. That doesn't mean that he has a fully formed ideology or worldview on every policy issue, but on certain areas where he has consistent mm -hmm. points of view, to the extent he's able politically to move forward with them, and obviously on foreign policy and on trade or where he has more unilateral power in our system. Uh, so he doesn't have as much power by himself to act on certain domestic policies. He, there's a Congress, after all. There's state governments. And so that's partially why you see him doing things like undoing the Iran deal, because that's something that he can do unilaterally. But I think it's very significant. Uh, the impact of this is likely to be quite long-lasting. And we don't know how it ends. And I have to uh, agree, unfortunately, sadly, with everything that Susan has just said. This is a uniquely disturbing period. And as a firm, former journalist myself, uh, I have to tell you that in more than 20 years of watching the transatlantic security space, this, as far as I'm concerned, is the, f the worst and most disturbing crisis of transatlantic relations that I have ever seen. Why do I say that? And I think that, by the way, as business women, you should pay, pay close attention to this, because I think that this is about to have a very significant impact on your field, if it doesn't already, frankly. Um, I say that because in all the fights that we've had between America and Europe, in, since the fall of the war, over the Yugoslav wars, over Iraq, over Libya, over many other things. We have always fought about the means, when to use force, for what reason, with whom. We're now fighting about the ends. 
We're now fighting about whether globalization is good or bad for us. We are now fighting about what relationship we want to have with the world, whether we want, even want to have a norms and rules-based international order. And we are fighting about whether alliances should be based on values and interests or just on transactional deals. Mm -hmm. And the Trump administration, to put it again very frankly, has spent the last few weeks humiliating and bullying its European allies, allies that it has had good and warm and highly cooperative relationships with since the end of the World War II. This, Laurie, we just heard you saying that you thought a trade war might happen. We're in the middle of it. The tariffs have just been imposed. And I see no leverage for Europeans to prevent that, or rather to get the US to withdraw them again. The US has withdrawn from the Iran agreement unilaterally after the Europeans tried very hard and with very many constructive suggestions to, to prevent them from doing that. Um, it's entirely possible that sanctions will now be imposed on the companies involved in the Nord Stream 2 project, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The North Korea summit, if it happens, poses grave concerns for allies, not just for the South Koreans and the Japanese who have already been put in very uncomfortable situations by the swinging, um, incoherent, and, and improvised diplomacy of Donald Trump. That will have an, a distinct impact on European trade interests in the Pacific, and the French and the Brits, of course, also have security interests there. And moving back to Europe, we have a NATO summit in mid-July. And the question is, what happens at the North Korea summit that might be a, pre a precedent for, for Europe? What if Donald Trump says, okay, you can denuclearize a little and I will withdraw some US forces from Europe, uh, from, from South Korea? That will be a precedent for Europe. That will be a precedent for the American-Russian relationship mm -hmm. and that could have a huge impact for, for us. Remember that Trump will be in Europe for the, the July NATO summit and to go to London and he doesn't like traveling. What if he decides then to go and finally meet the man whom he's wanted to meet all the time, Vladimir Putin. No, I would definitely agree that we have um, heightened political risk, and I didn't mean to gloss over for a moment uh, the impact of some of the tra recent trade um, you know, tariffs and things of that nature. But keep in mind that the global trade today is $90 trillion, and the magnitude of some of these tariffs at the moment is in the tens or hundreds of billions of dollars. So it's really, while it's not good at all. Um, it doesn't yet uh, reach the kind of level that we would characterize as a trade war. A trade war could look like something like 10% reduced, um, or t have basically 10% of global trade being, um, you know, imposed tariffs and things of that nature, which would be more like nine trillion versus, you know, where we are today. So, but but I would completely agree that the um, importance of political risk right now and the level of political risk right now is higher than we've seen probably in our lifetimes. Um, you, you hope that um, somehow we start to get the message out that global trade is good, that in fact it may feel bad to people sitting in Indiana, uh, United States of America, who lost their job in the steel company, but that in fact they're able to buy t-shirts for you know, 10 or $12 instead of $100 that they were all made in America. That there are you know, benefits that we get from global trade that um, need to be, that, that story needs to be told in a way that it hasn't been told so far. The sad truth, frankly, is that we have very few attractive options with regard to the tariffs. We had no options on the JCPOA. Our trade, Europe's trade, with America is far bigger than any trade we have with Iran. And so I, I suspect that we are just, in fact, um, the companies active there from Total and onwards have all said they're just going to roll up their operations and leave. Now, um, is this going to be good? Is this going to be destabilizing for Iran? Will there be an infighting in Iran? Could that, could that spill over to the region? Could that create additional migrant outflows that head for Europe? Yes, yes, and yes. So we should be worried about this. It's, this is not just a, 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 a sanctions problem. It's about to translate into a massive geopolitical problem. Um, so I think, frankly, what the answer for us is, is, not, is, is to open the frame to become more strategic as Europeans, to work on our internal cohesion, to work on our unity, and to 
and to learn to speak as one in a concert of great powers that is increasingly based on friction and competition. That's a huge amount of work, and I think it starts with repairing our domestic polities and repairing domestic unities so the populists don't win anymore. Yeah.